So the last panel for today, uh, it's strate strategies to unlock human capital. And I've got three uh, terrific panelists here with me. So I've got Mehrush, uh, Mehrnush Aryanpur. She's, um, she's a lawyer with, in the Washington DC office of Gibson, Dunn and Quatcher. Um, I've got Asiye Hotami, who's the founder and the managing director of Iran Talent, the leading online recruitment service. And Fatih Soleimani, who co-found and heads Kudaku, the, um, the premier online baby product retailer in Iran. So please join me in welcoming uh, the three panelists. So I wanted to jump in and, and ask um, what it is that you most noticed uh, when you returned to Iran, because a couple of you on this panel, Mehrnoush and Fatih, um, you lived and worked outside of Iran for a number of years. So what it is that stuck with you most, you know, or surprised you most when you returned and, and started working again with, uh, with Iranians? Um, let me first say that I'm truly humbled to be among. Is this microphone working? It's working. Can you can you hear can me? You hear me? Um, truly humbled to be among so many talented and accomplished individuals. Um, and uh, yes, every time I go to Iran, I come back very fascinated and impressed by Iran and Iranians. I was just there for Nowruz and um, had uh, privilege to spend some time with friends who went to the same law school as I did. And, um, but they didn't leave Iran, and they stayed, and they're practicing law, and they're practicing, um, and they're, they're involved and engaged with large transactions and uh, important trials in the country. And um, I was impressed to see first that, and, uh, and above all, that Iran uh, survived, and Iranians have survived. They've survived, the san they've survived sanctions. They've survived a troubled economy. And, um, and not only they've survived, they actually, um, they have found a perfect uh, work-life balance. They're happy. So uh, their happy approach to life and their resilience uh, really humbled me. Yeah, for me, I uh, returned in Iran uh, two years ago uh, to start my uh, startup and to launch it. And uh, what was interesting for me is that um, the talents that you find in Iran are quite am amazing, pretty smart, eager to learn. Um, but when I started interviewing the young generation, what I noticed is when you speak with them and you ask them about their career plans or their aspiration, um, uh, I mean, not a lot of them come uh, back with some uh, real career plans or aspirations. Uh, I actually used to ask them, who is your role model? And most of the time they would, I mean, their local role model, and most of the time they would give me names of foreign Iranians uh, that have been successful. Um, and so basically, the, um, when you try to recruit in Iran, people are very, have this very short-term opportunit uh, opportunistic approach of um, uh, jumping from one job to the other one and uh, creating, um, so they, they don't really create valuable experience uh, by staying in the same position. So um, it was very difficult for us to find, for example, middle uh, managers or um, uh, high-level managers with the, the kind of skill set that you would expect or the, the standard that you would have uh, in, in Europe. Um, um, of course, it's due to some certain, uh, I mean, the uncertainty that you have in, in the country. And also in my space, uh, e-commerce, I mean, retail, um, you, uh, I mean, when you know the space, 97% of uh, the retail in Iran is traditional, right? So mom and pop shops. Um, so it's very small entities and uh, the people are not getting necessarily the training they should get uh, to become uh, middle managers and, and, and you know, build the loyalty to the company. So I think one of the challenges will be to, um, with the consolidation of this market uh, and you know, all these big groups coming in the country, to have all these small groups work together in an organized way. So I see that as a challenge. Mm -hmm. And Asya, you, um, with Iran Talent, you do uh, annual reports uh, analyzing the, 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 the labor market. I wanted to ask you, what, what are the underlying trends that you see in, uh, in, in the labor market? Yeah. Um, 
Actually, the trend that I can see, um, <laughs> not necessarily due to the uh, annual reports that we, prefer, we prepare every year, but what we actually see is um, we see the average age of entering the job market has um, increased a lot. Um, from early 20s, we can see now late 20s and sometimes go to 30 years old. So you interview a 30-year-old guy and you see there's no experience, just get out of university. Um, they're very high education, um, but unfortunately not much experience, as Fadi mm -hmm. said. Um, but on the other side, um, we've noticed that um, entrepreneurship has increased. Um, I mean, we can see that, um, I mean, it, it's actually, um, Iranians love to have their own businesses. I mean, from 13 years ago when we started um, Iran Talent, I used to in interview many candidates. And um, as the answer is, what is your plan for the next five, 10 years? I want to have my own business. I want to, have my own, I want to be my own boss. I think um, everyone has the, has the same experience in Iran. But the fact is that, um, well, I think worldwide, um, run, starting a new business, um, um, they have options of uh, starting a new business with less costs, um, running an online business. Uh, they don't have to um, try to get loans from the banks and they don't have to get, like, uh, beg the father to give them some money to start a business. So uh, we can see that there are more entrepreneurs um, starting their own businesses. Mm -hmm. um, this, these are the two main changes we've seen in the trend. But in terms of the um, job market, well, it has actually gone more local rather than international. I mean, we used to have more international companies in Iran, let's say, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, but now um, it's a bit less. Maybe after the sanctions, we'll see them more in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, just because we have on the panel two people who have experience of you know, working outside of Iran and inside of Iran, and you have you know, different perspectives, um, I was wondering, you know, if you could also elaborate, Mehnoush probably, uh, you would be good on that. Uh, you know, Iranians often say that they're misunderstood uh, mm -hmm. by the West. What it is that, you know, what it is that Iranians think the West doesn't get about them? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there is definitely, um, a, the West has definitely wrong perception about Iranians, and I would, uh, like to discuss, uh, to talk about my own personal life because I went to the West as an Iranian. And um, so I would rather to answer that question in, in terms of what West thinks about Iranian women. And uh, I think the West uh, thinks that Iranian women are victims and we clearly aren't. And uh, um, I can't blame anyone because I'm for in my personal experience when I went to Afghanistan a couple of years ago, before going to Afghanistan, I was saw Afghan women of some sort of victims or abused and uh, or beaten up by their husbands. But when I went there and I actually saw the reality on the ground was different. Afghan women were member of the parliament and uh, they hold public offices and and warriors. So the, there is definitely wrong perception about Iranian women. Iranian women are those who send their in the time of war their. Uh, distinguish themselves by sending their sons and their husbands to, to front lines to protect the landline against Iraq aggression. What kind of victims? We're not victims. So I don't need the West to go to Iran and uh, start uh, lecturing about lean-in because we're already here at the table. So, uh, and if, if the West looks at Iran and say, well, ladies, lean-in, that's, that's a wrong approach because what would happen is they're not going to solve the real issue, which the real issue uh, it's not an Iran-specific issue, it's a global gender issue that needs to be tackled seriously. And the global gender issue in a simple example is when a woman wakes up, she doesn't think that, oh, uh, I'm a woman, what am I going to do this morning? But they will definitely wake up with some sort of insecurities about appearance maybe, looks, age, or I'm not good enough, or I maybe uh, I'm not adequate, and that oh, those problems are the issues that are my concern, and I think they're global issues, and they need to be. Uh, so the Iranian women need to be understood, and those issues need to be tackled uh, properly. Mm -hmm. So we do have a, a strong number of Iranian, uh, very highly educated Iranian women, and they're and they're very willing uh, to be part of of, uh, of the labor force. But Asya, can you um, elaborate a bit more on you know what type of skills are easily found in Iran, and what are those that are that are more rare? Because I'm also hearing you know some of the employers saying, actually we're having 
a very hard time finding the, the suitable candidate for us. And uh, why is that? Hmm. That's true, actually. I mean, uh, the problem is that uh, unemployment is high, but at the same time, employers can't find the people they need. Um, you know, if you're asking me about the functions, I mean, which functions are easily easier to find and which functions are difficult to find, I can say that, um, I mean, people are educated in all different functions. I mean, we have engineers, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have accountants, we have finance people, we have lots of MBA graduates. So in terms of education, it's quite high. I mean, as um, also the um, previous presentations we had here, education is quite high. Um, the problem um, are actually the skills. Um, the, uh, they're fast learners, Iranian, um, and um, they're ready to learn, they love to learn. They go to university, they start with bachelors, they go to masters, and then don't, they don't stop, they go to PhD. <laughs> and when you ask them why, uh, it's like, I want to finish it, I want to just, just learn. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, when it goes to competencies, soft skills, um, like teamwork, communication, like coaching skills. I mean, these are quite weak, and maybe because there hasn't been enough training um, for these sort of skills. But, um, well, as Fadi said, looking short term towards the, um, towards the job is one of the main challenges. But, I mean, I would, I would always um, say there are two different groups of talents in the market. Um, there are a group of talents which, uh, uh, are not the major groups, but um, a small percentage are expert on the job, they're specialized, they know what to do, you can um, actually find them, give the job, and then they'll take the job, um, which is a war uh, between companies to get these sort of people, because they're not many. And then there's a group with um, very less experience, uh, not well trained, quite fresh, but you can train them. Hmm? So these are two different groups, and you have to deal with them differently. Like those people who look short term, because um, they're those experienced people, and other companies try to headhunt them with, with a higher package, with a, with a better title. You know, Iranians love titles. Um, so, I mean, uh, you have to deal with these people differently. They're different strategies, actually. Um, and do you, I mean, you've brought together hundreds of job applicants and, and employers. Uh, can thousands, you talk? Yeah. <laughs> thousands. Can you talk about, uh, you know, if you've seen any successful strategies that was put in place by those employers to better engage the, the local workforce? Mm. Um, you know, actually, the best strategies, I guess, came from the multinationals, which have been successful um, in operating in Iran. Um, in, in our experience dealing with uh, like uh, many, many international companies um, working in Iran, mainly in the past and a few uh, right now, um, I think we can learn from them how, what they did and the others can, uh, can get, uh, guide out of that. I think one of the most important things is to invest heavily on training. So we don't have to always try to find the most experienced person, the most expert person for the role, but we can get the um, fresher ones and then invest on them. Um, this kind of investment which actually, um, actually uh, uh, helps us keep the candidates much more. I mean, um, there's sort of commitment which um, we, can, we can see them more long-term as short-term candidates. Um, and at the same time, I guess, uh, government also puts some support on these companies who transfer the technology or, or train the team. Um, secondly, I can say, um, uh, invest on the culture. Because um, training brings the skill, uh, but you need the, um, like, it, culture, international culture, to bring in the, within the organization. So you can use um, internationally experienced people, bring them in the local office, and then that would actually push the culture towards the discipline and the organized version which you're looking for. Um, uh, actually, thirdly, which is very important, um, uh, make them have a dream with the company. Um, that dream can come through a career path, uh, could come from a future that they can see within your organization. I mean, they should see, okay, what will happen for me after 10 years within the organization? Um, and especially, um, I mean, one of the very good experiences which candidates have is when they see that um, 
me as an Iranian candidate, I am part of the global organization. I will have the opportunity to go to other offices if I'm the good guy, if I work well, if I'm committed, if I'm long term. And um, I remember BAT um, doing quite well in this field. I mean, they tried to uh, just send one or two of them after a while when they send them to other offices. The others just give an example. If I work well, if I am committed, if I uh, do my job well, then I would have the opportunity as well. Um, and um, I mean, lastly, it's very important that you don't think that um, high salaries will always uh, solve all the problems. Um, so high salaries at the beginning, you might be able to hire the best, but it's not easy to retain the best. Um, salary is just a short-term option. Mm -hmm. It's better to have a structured version. Um, Nestle is among the, one of the best ones, I guess, in my experience. They don't pay the highest salaries among the international companies in Iran, but what they do, um, they put a career path, they put very good training for the team, and then you can see that the candidate employees are very committed to the mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. Although, although the salary is not, I mean, it's good salaries, I'm not saying it's bad, but not as much as like BAT is paying. much better benefits though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so Fatih, we're hearing a lot about the surge in startups in Iran these days. Yep. And, um, you know, I'm wondering how helpful that has been in engaging, you know, younger, you know, bringing younger Iranians into the, into the workforce and, you know, in particular women. Yeah, um, uh, look, um, there is definitely a surge in, uh, in uh, the startups and in p particular in tech startup. I mean, it's bringing a hope to the new generation uh, that is uh, definitely very tech savvy and uh, willing to go in, in those businesses. And they feel that they're going to get, I mean, they're going to bring something. It's inspirational. And I think inspiration is very important mm -hmm. uh, to them and it's very inspirational for them. Um, however, um, it's still a very small sector. The ecosystem is still very small. If you compare it, I mean, to to the rest of the world um, in seed and uh, early stage uh, financing. I mean, in the U.S., of course, you can't really compare the U.S., but uh, it's a, around six, uh, six billion that is invested in, in those sectors. And I'm not talking about the whole venture capital because the whole venture capital would be 20 billion. Um, in, uh, in France, for instance, you have around two billion per year uh, which are invested in uh, seed and early stage. Um, um, a closer country to us, uh, Turkey, uh, is investing 40 million in those, sect uh, in, in those um, uh, early stage financing. Uh, in Iran, we're very far from that. So it's the very beginning of that sector. And I think um, with the growth, uh, we're going to have much more innovation. Right now, we're at the stage where a lot of the young generation is doing co copycat models um, uh, of, of uh, foreign uh, uh, let's say, uh, e-commerce or anything else. It's the same thing as in Turkey. It's the early stage. Um, but as, as we see more VCs come in, more investment come in, um, uh, you're going to get the, the young generation more interested and in mm -hmm. coming and bringing innovation and, you know, being inspired. Mm. And I wanted also to, um, to move on a bit uh, outside of Iran uh, and ask you about the, the role of the, of the diaspora. How do you think, uh, you know, in terms of those missing skills that we were talking about earlier, how do you think that the diaspora can, can better contribute um, to, uh, to, to Iran or, 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 or those skills that were missing? Yeah, I, I think to the point that you were making, I mean, the, the skills and the experience is missing in, in the country. The, they, the people are quite experts in their fields. They're, they're, they're very strong um, skill sets, but um, I think the diaspora can bring that middle management or um, high level management and the training, I mean, uh, business projections and uh, those kind of visions or, or even finance, long, um, you know, long term finance vi uh, visions um, I think these are the skills that are missing in the country and that mm -hmm. the diaspora has a role to play. Having said that, I mean, from my own experience in Iran, um, um, it is important to also have very strong uh, local partners um, uh, because we're, um, there is a big difference between the way we operate um, and um, uh, people in the country operate. And uh, it takes a while to understand, and I think we need to spend time to understand the, the psychology of the country 
country. So that, uh, having uh, people that you train um, and that you can rely on as uh, local partners and they can help train the rest of the people, that's very important. Building loyalty in the country is, um, is something that uh, we need to work on. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. And Mehrnoush, what advice do you have for um, an Iranian who's been living outside the country and, and is looking to re-engage professionally with Iran? From, you know, from your experience, what, what would you uh, give in terms of advice? Um, well, uh, I'm having a hard time to distinguish between to Iranians inside Iran and Iranians outside Iran. I guess I always look at it as Iranians. And um, I understand some Iranians have spent a lot of time outside the country. I also understand they may not be very comfortable with Farsi, especially reading and writing, or may, they may not appreciate how much we love poetry and the Persian literature that is, is intertwined with our identity for those that we, that we grew up in Iran. Uh, but what I know is that uh, Iranians outside Iran are as driven, as excited, and as passionate as uh, about the post-sanctions Iran as the Iranians inside Iran. And uh, they, have, uh, they have a big love in common, and that's the love for giving back to the country and where they come from. And uh, it doesn't even matter if uh, they don't understand a word in Farsi because they, they understand the values, even though they might have picked up some Western habits on the way. But uh, I guess they, at some point we all knew that the, the destination uh, is Iran. And, uh, so on that note, I can say that I may not have a specific advice for those Iranians outside Iran, uh, but uh, we love, I told you, we love Persian poetry. It's just us, so I can't help myself. I have to cite a poem by uh, our beloved Banu Simine Behbahani, who has, it, uh, who has said so beautifully that, Dobare mi sazamat vatan, دوباره می سازمت وطن اگر چه با خشت جان خیش ستون به سقف تو می زنم اگر چه با استخان خیش We need a translation for those who don't speak Farsi. <laughs> It will get so lost. You don't want me to translate that. It's a lot of sacrifice there. It involves, a lot, it, it, it involves rebuilding the country through a lot of yes. sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, so on that note, I'd like to open it to the audience um, for any questions. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, microphone, no one is there. <laughs> yeah. there will, there, there's one coming, I'm sorry. There. Excuse me? Um, sorry, Latin. Yeah. Yep, um, after the we question. can hear you. I just wanted to add something to the points uh, which Fatih and Mehrnush made on uh, sure. the Iranians outside Iran. Um, actually, it was so romantic, but my words are a bit harsh about. Uh, um, but but um, I mean, the fact which we can see in the market is uh, when an uh, employer is deciding whether to bring a foreigner to Iran to work um, um, as an work as an expat, or decide whether to bring an Iranian expat to Iran. They should bring an Iranian expat, obviously. Well, um, oh, I, should, <laughs> I don't know about it. Should, but the thing which we see is the difference is usually um, when they bring a foreigner is a foreigner who has the experience of the emerging markets, but when they are thinking about bringing Iranians. Iranians are usually um, from developed countries. Hmm. So, um, I mean, they need to understand that um, we are among the emerging markets. So there are much more challenges. So if those Iranians are coming, they're facing more challenges than what they're facing right now. Maybe they're perfect in what they're doing right now. And I can say that um, one of the most effective um, things that Iranian, Iranian expats had done in Iran is when they act as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm because they're ready for the challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, recent years, we have seen lots of changes made by these kind of Iranians who came to Iran. They started okay. to run a business from scratch with all the challenges. Maybe like this. Yeah, yeah. like that, yeah. 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 What is the perfect example? Like, okay, just from a point of view. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Did the micro arrive? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Baha Sadat Tarani from Saziba, and this uh, question is addressed to Ms. Hatami from Iran Talent. Sure. First of all, I want to thank you because you supported our company and uh, 
the industry and Iran a lot. I mean, the Iran talent has been an integral part of uh, the country, and really, the, it's a blessing having you there. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, I mean, the question that I had is why is it? I mean, we always talk about uh, the soft skills that Iranians don't have and we need to develop. And through IT and through basically a lot of educational programs that we can have online, we can develop those skills and it's not being done to the extent that it should be. Why isn't Iran talent or companies uh, working in this field supporting and making this happen? Because it's, it's very important we are trying to do it as a company for ourselves, but I think we can do it as, a, a, as a companies in Iran more so and uh, try to develop our talent pool better. I don't understand and I don't see why it's not uh, mm -hmm. really being done more proactive by, by us, you Thank mean. You. Yeah, or by all of us. Mm -hmm. in, in well, by others, I don't know, but by us, um, well, actually, we, we are more focused on um, online recruitment, and we prefer to do one thing right um, instead of doing several things. We, we are actually not perfect, actually, but we try to be um, as good as possible in one field. But personally, I believe that um, you know that Iranians go to lots of trainings. Um, they, they study English from day one when they go to kindergarten up to university, but they still can't speak English. Um, so, um, I mean, these competencies and these soft skills even is more difficult than learning a language. It, I mean, I personally think it doesn't come through uh, just an online training. Um, it should be like, yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. It needs coaching. It, it's a culture to be penetrated in the, in, in it's a diff the blood. Difficult challenge. I mean, as yeah. a businessman and as a yeah, person running companies in Iran, it's one of the major challenges we are faced with. Yeah. Any more questions? Here. The mic is coming. Yes, uh, hi, my name is Gordon Grant from G2 Metrics in the US. I have a question for Ms. Hatami, just uh, uh, about this term, uh, designation, emerging markets. Um, you know, I, I just came back from about a month in Iran. It was my first trip there, and it was partly for business and partly for, for personal, but I, I'm curious, because you're very much involved in the hiring business, how you arrive at designating Iran an emerging market. My, my business uh, in the hedge fund industry has taken me to I think about 36 countries in the course of 10 years. And when I think emerging market, I think of uh, a place like Venezuela or a place like uh, Burma or uh, even a place like India, right, where we have extreme poverty, uh, lack of social services and so forth. Whereas what I saw in Iran struck me as a very developed country with people with high uh, degree of skill sets in, as you say, specific pockets. So. Do you, do you feel that emerging market is really the right term for Iran, or should we come up with something else? Uh, Mr. Amiri has suggested re-emerging, or is it something else, right? Uh, and that, that's kind of what I felt when I was there, as I look at Iran as a, a business opportunity for myself. I don't view it in an emerging markets lens, so I'm mm -hmm. just wondering how you, you might make that language a little more precise, if at mm -hmm. all. Um, uh, actually, um, maybe the word is not the exact word, but what I'm saying is that there are much more challenges um, when you work in Iran. Uh, I mean, the point is that when you are a successful manager in a developed country, um, in a very disciplined company, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can be a successful manager in Iran. That's, that's the main point. Uh, whatever terms um, I mean, we use, uh, they're two different things. Here, when you bring someone to Iran, you have to develop many things. I was just chatting with um, uh, one of uh, a friend here, um, came just from abroad for three months. He was saying that things um, doesn't run, uh, are not quickly and not easily done as when we are uh, living in Canada. I mean, he was living in Canada. I mean, things are very much different. It doesn't, everything go, doesn't go back necessarily to you, but um, I mean, to everyone working in the company. Thank you. Um, 
I can see there are more questions, but unfortunately I have to close the panel discussion. But these ladies will be amongst us, and as a matter of fact, we're going to be moving to, uh, to the ballroom uh, at 6.30 for drinks. So I urge you to connect with each other and ask more questions in, in a more for, informal setting. Thank you very much, and please give a round of applause to the panelists. <laughs>